Today's reading comes from the book of Luke, chapter 19, <laughs> verses 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. Uh, on a 
policy we were looking at professions that people despise the most or the most despised professions, I guess. And uh, because in our scripture, we've got uh, a scripture of what we call a rich tax collector. And uh, in that scripture, some people were not very happy about who he was. And so I just thought it'd be interesting to find out what's the 10 most despised professions in America. And so we want to give that to you. And uh, Dax, could you read that list off for us, please? Yes, I'd be happy to, Pastor. Thank you very much. Uh, these are the 10 most despised professions, not people, but professions. Well, wait a minute. By hand, or just somebody yell out, what's a profession you think is most despised? Attorney lawyers. Attorney lawyers, all right. IRS. IRS. All right. Ed, Ed. I'm sorry, Ed. I'm sorry if you're a lawyer. You're good lawyers, but anyway. Any others? One more. The president. The president. He can't win. So you got 51% or not, right? No matter what president's in there. All right, so let's go. Let's Number 10, Wall Street Traders. Oh, I was like, oh, that's right. I was going to take it out that. Number 10, Department of Motor Vehicles Clerks. Any amens there? Not Perrysburg, I'm just saying. They're very nice. Perrysburg, they were very nice. I've been there twice, took care of me immediately. They were pleasant people. Can't say that another time. Number eight, insurance salesman. <laughs> wow, I got the get them. Number seven, IRS tax auditors. <laughs> Sorry, Ed. Present company excluded. Number six, journalists. <laughs> Number five, political lobbyists. Yes. I have never <laughs> met a political lobbyist, so I don't know. <laughs> okay, all right. Number four, labor union leaders. I've met a few of those. No. <laughs> okay. Number That's three, it. aren't you one? I, I know, but I play <laughs> I, I I on television. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Number three, lawyers. Uh, there was no copy. <laughs> you guys got an answer right. <laughs> okay. Number two, car salesmen. That's right. All right. Give you a big can of corn. All right. <laughs> And number four, what, number one, close J, members of Congress. There you go. Top ten most despised professions as of now in America. <laughs> I was so glad to see Pastor wasn't up there. <laughs> so, we just didn't pull enough poll numbers out there, I guess. But um, that's what this the story is all about. It's a profession that is so despised, so hated by the community that there can be no redemption, there can be no friendship, there cannot be any communi community at all. This person must be an outsider, period, for what he chose to do for a living. Now, granted, this particular person that we read has great influence with Rome and other tax collectors because he's the chief of all tax collectors. He has those people, but he has no real friends, no real friendships out there. Again, by a profession that was either chosen by him or for him. And again, the other part what I want to talk about is that money, when it comes to wealth, and believe me, I would love to be wealthy. Amen, I would. I would love to have some money to buy stuff or basically fix my tires on my car, things like that when it happens, you know. Anything that I would just be able to go, all right, it's taken care of. I would love to have that wealth. But when it comes to wealth, let's be totally honest about it. The richer you are, the dirtier the money. That's just a fact. And the reason being is that somebody had to get stepped on for you to get that money. And whether it's somebody immediately under you that you did certain things to so you could get up on the corporate ladder and, and move forward, or maybe it's the clothes you wear. Because they were made in another country by people who can't afford to say, no, that's not how we're going to live and work our jobs. Somehow, some way, that money became dirty. And the very higher it goes up, the dirtier it gets. That has been true since the beginning of time. And so when you look at your money and how much money you have, it might be interesting to see what you're going to do with your money in this life. Or better yet, for the kingdom later. 
And so when it comes to wealth, I have to read a story about a different person in the book of Luke. Uh, this doctor who wrote this book decided to give us what they call case studies, like most doctors do. And they look at case studies and decide uh, what's the treatment for this particular um, ailments in life. And then will that same treatment work for this case over here and vice versa? And then he presents it in a way to where we as an audience gets to look at these case studies and study them and say, OK, how do the overall picture of this this whole theme look like for us? And so in order to read the last um, Z- Zacchaeus story, we have to go back in chapter 15 and read about a different rich person and see how the community reacted and see how he reacted to the same kind of a situation, what we call meeting Jesus. And so both of these particular men wanted to meet Jesus and this story is called the rich ruler. Now the rich ruler, a certain ruler, asked him, said to Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that's a loaded question right off the bat. And he's letting us know because when you say a rich ruler is asking this, basically he's saying, how do I buy this? I have a lot of stuff and a lot of money. And the one thing I don't have is a guaranteed certificate that says I have eternal life. So how do I get that? I would like to obtain that. Now, both stories, there's a crowd amongst this. So there's a conversation happening to where you're the crowd and we're having a conversation, Tim and I, and he's asking me this in front of the crowd and the crowd wants to know, okay, how shall we answer eternal life question? Because this rich young ruler is famous, obviously. Everybody loves him. No one's saying anything bad about him. He's got everything in his pocket, got friends, family, and everything. He's got great wealth. And for some reason, everybody believes his wealth is good wealth compared to another person that we'll see in Zacchaeus where his wealth is bad wealth. Both of them, rich people, one good because the community says so, the other bad because the community says so. They both have wealth. They both have power. They both have influence. Let's see what happens. So what should I get to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to him, first of all, why do you call me good? You don't even know me. You never looked for me. You never seeked after me. You never ate dinner with me. Right? So why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. And then he says, you know the commandments. Because you hang out with all the cool kids. And all the cool kids know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And quickly he replies, I have kept all these since I was young. That's a little conceited, isn't it? I mean, really? You were good to your parents since you were young? Amen. (laughs) Okay. All right. That's fair then. Since you say this and you're not bearing false witness about your life story, let's keep going. (laughs) When Jesus heard this, he said to him, there's still one thing lacking. Sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor. So obviously when he's saying that to do something with your wealth and do this particular thing with your wealth, What he's really saying to us as a congregation is saying, this man doesn't give his money away. Well, that's how you become rich, right? You keep, 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 take, take, take. You don't give it away. That's just silly talk, isn't it? And so he says, do this one thing. Give to the poor. And then you you will have treasures in heaven. And then come follow me. So he's saying, get rid of everything, give it to the poor, do the one thing that you need to do, which is right by all people, give it away, and then do the one thing I know that's going to be troublesome for you because you're going to rely on me, not yourself, not your wealth, you're going to follow me. And then you have to trust me to take care of you. Well, that's even scarier for us as individuals, isn't it? Because each and every one of us wants to follow Jesus, but we want to follow Jesus in a safe pattern, Right? We want to make sure that there's some distance between me and Jesus, my buffer to make sure everything's okay with me and Jesus and the world, and still be able to come and sing in the choir, amen? (laughs) Uh, Not even an amen from the choir today. 
So there is that part where we have to trust Jesus. And even then, it is hard then, it is hard now. And I understand that. And Jesus understands that. But he's going to give us a little help later on. He says, come follow me. But when he heard this, he became sad. A sad, sad rich man. Because he was very rich. Jesus looked at him and said, hmm, how hard is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? Now remember, the kingdom of God is not something that's far away, some distant future for us. The kingdom of God for Jesus is always here and now, in the present. How do I live in the presence with you and God? And if I can do that, I am in the kingdom of God. I am creating the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. And so he is saying, wow, how hard is it for a rich person, any rich people in here, to live with Jesus? I did that just to see if I can get more capital campaign. <laughs> <laughs> no one bit. <laughs> you guys are getting wise to me. You're getting wise to me. All right? How hard is for them to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, when I first read that as a Christian, I thought that was the dumbest statement I've ever heard in my life. Really? A camel going through a needle. I mean, I look at my mom's needles and stuff, and she always had me be the one that had to thread the little needle. And I thought, wow, really? A camel through a needle. Then no one can do this, right? And obviously I'm not dumb because the rest of these people said the same thing. Well, then how who's going to be able to enter the kingdom of God? Entering the eye of the, uh, the, the, the eye of the, uh, the <laughs> entering the, I can't even say it now. Basically, it's a gate in Jerusalem. And it's a small gate. Basically, you can fit one animal kind of snug through it. But it was a commerce gate. And so in order to uh, make good money, you didn't want to go all the way around town. You want to kind of do the shortcut through the, uh, what they call the eye of the needle, get right into the market squares, get your goods going and stuff. The problem was you had this giant stuff all over your camels and stuff, which means you had to take it off, lay it on the side, and then have somebody take it into the other side of the gate, and hopefully none of it would be gone by the time you get on the other side. So very rich people who like to keep their money did not go through that particular gate because they knew they would lose a portion of their stuff. And so it became a very hard thing for them to do. One that was too expensive, too costly, and just not, well, it didn't fit right for their own hearts. And so I was like, wow, somebody that can have life a little easier, a little quicker, and you're more worried about losing a percentage of your stuff than you are to get your good stuff, sell it, take care of people. And so they all looked and they said, well, so it's hard for someone to enter through the eye of the needle and for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, how then who can be saved? And he replied, what is impossible for mortals is possible for God. And then this particular man named Peter, who's been hanging out with Jesus for roughly three years. It was almost maybe three and a half, but we're not sure of the timeline, but definitely over three years. Hanging out with him day by day. Watch this particular Jesus raise people from the dead, do crazy stuff, walk on the water, you name it. He goes and says, whoa, what about us? Look, we have left our homes to follow you. Thinking, it sounds like, where's our money? Where's our cut? Because we're following the king of kings. And we all know kings have money. Amen. And so kind of where's our cut? We're following you. Where's our treasures now? See, well, again, the kingdom of God is at hand right here. So my treasure should be right here and now. Well, I followed you. You set up the rich guy, sell everything coming. You'll have bigger treasures than what he had. And if I follow you and I've left my home, where's mine at? And he said to them, truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not get back the very much more in this age and the age to come. Eternal life. Now church, if somebody sold you a bill of sales that come in and believe in Jesus Christ that everything was going to be good, fancy, and dandy, you might want to go and have a conversation with them. Because that's not the case. We're only guaranteed one thing. And one thing only. 
eternal life or eternal death. That's it. The rest of it is how do we live in a broken world with broken people with broken stuff here? And then can we turn that brokenness into something better than it, than, than it is and what it should have always been? And then we work out what, what they would call working out your salvation and what that looks like. But you're only promised one thing, one rich, one great prize, eternal life. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good to me. To be able to live forever with God in his kingdom and see things I've never seen before and witness things that have never been made before. I find that interesting. Better yet, I even find it better that I can live on earth right now with you and have a relationship with you to where I can feel love towards you and then receive love back from you, which is amazing in itself, just the word love. And so we see that this whole story comes down to a rich person having all the things in the world and deciding the cost for eternal life is too great. Because my life has to change today. Now we jump forward in Luke. And we have another situation with a rich person. Same thing. Rich people. And what happens to rich people? So the Spirit always draws all kinds of people to Jesus. And we have to understand that as a church. And this, this Zacchaeus, he desires and endeavors to see Jesus. We don't know why he wants to see Jesus. But we do know one thing. is that in the scripture it says he's trying to get to see who this Jesus is. And something stops him. Well, two things. One, he's short. Amen. All right. I don't know what it's like to be really short, but I don't think I'm tall for my height. All right. But I can tell you, I have a short friend, and it is frustrating sometimes when you're in a crowd going to the ball games and things like that, keeping an eye on where he's at. All right. Now, can you imagine being short and everybody hate you? Okay. Do you think you're going to get from point A to point B? In a matter of any time, quickly, any time, any time soon. No, because people hate you and they're going to say, well, you're short. And what do you do to short people? You kind of push them, don't you? Even though this particular short person is going to tax you, whatever tax it looks like. Because he became a rich tax ruler by collecting more than he was supposed to. Back then, this is how taxes worked. It was very simple. Rome said, we need this. And then they appointed you or someone else to collect that. And how you collected that was that you took another percentage. And you did it any way you want. So in Maumee, it might be 7%. Everybody has to pay there. But here, because you live in Perrysburg, we're taking 20. Amen? <laughs> I only have to give Rome free. <laughs> All right? And then my boss would take a percentage off of that. And their boss would take a percentage off of that. And the rich young, their, uh, Zacchaeus himself was the chief, which means he got percentages from everybody. Anybody who lived in Wood County and all the tax collectors from there and each tax collector gets to decide again If you're in township you get a certain if you live in Par Perrysburg proper It's a certain percentage and all you historical people. I'm taking you for at least 26 percent. All right. Amen It's historical. You know what I'm saying? This should be a little more and so that's how that process worked People weren't very happy about that. I hear today Some people are not so happy about some of the taxes already around here Especially water, I hear, right? Is that it? Or something. I'm not real sure. I just hear rumors, all right? And so they can't be true. Uh, that's how taxes work for them. And so even today, we still get upset about who takes our taxes and how much and whether it's a fair and equal price. But the truth of it is, once we see someone or hear, no offense, Ed, that you actually do work for the IRS or did work for the IRS, something stirs up in you and go, ooh, <laughs> I don't know if I will like that particular person or definitely that organization or anybody who comes out of that particular place, even though they're just doing a job like anybody else is supposed to do a job and they are seeking the same things you're seeking, love, hope, joy, peace. And so we see that in this particular town in Jericho, Jesus is moving from a town that's way in the desert towards the mountain on his way to the cross. And Zacchaeus jumps up into a tree to see who this Jesus is. He was trying to see Jesus was, but on the account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead, he climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass the way. Now something interesting happens. All along, 
God seeks you. Now, you may think you're seeking God, or you may be pursuing God, or you want to know more of who God is, but I'm telling you, it's what we call venial grace, is the wooing of God. God woos you before you knew you were being wooed. As one person says, he hunts you out like your prey, <laughs> right? Yeah, he's going to get you. And then there's a moment in your life where you realize that the power of the Holy Spirit speaks to you and draws you closer to the divine. And that moment could have happened when you were young. It could happen when you were older. It could happen today. It could happen several times. But there is one moment in your life where you remember God spoke to me. And he did it at the best time I knew. And so all along, Zacchaeus is just wanting to know who this Jesus is. Because he's doing some crazy stuff throughout the land, especially in Galilee, which is not too far down the road from Jericho. You know, what's going on? Who is this person? So he climbs a tree, wants to find out, but the crowd, well, we'll just say it, the church, their church at the time, the very Jews that they were, thought he was too bad, too far gone, and not the right type of person to be in our country. And so they booted him to the side, even though he's rich. Now, I don't know about you, but my son came back from Mexico, from Tijuana. We went, we had an orphanage there. I did 12 years of ministry there. And one year he went, his very first year, he comes back, and everybody stands up on the stage and gives their testimony about what the mission trip meant for them. And everybody's like talking about the orphans and talking about the poor and talking about the water conditions and, and how they could have ate dog or they weren't sure if they did eat dog, you know, that kind of thing, those kind of stories. And they're, they're reliving this piece. And my son stands up and he says, rich people need saved too. That was it. And everybody was thinking about that. And, and it shocked me. It blew my head up. And then he says, because you know if a rich person gets saved, a lot of kids get fed. And he sat down. I was like, oh, that's my boy. <laughs> I didn't feed him that. That was the Holy Spirit. But there was truth into that. That every person needs a Savior. And when that Savior jumps into the world, things change. I'm not saying your life gets better and you get roses and unicorns like Joby. I mean, nothing like that. But I'm saying, she's our kids minister, if you don't know. But it's, I'm just saying that, you know, things happen in your world. I don't know about you, but I, I have more smiles than I did. I have more laughter than I did. I definitely have more comfort than I ever did. And so this man just wanted to check him out gets up there and Jesus responds to those who seek him always. And he does it like this. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for I will stay at your house today. What does that mean? He means, I'm going to dinner with you. That's it. I'm going to break some bread with you. I'm going to break bread later in Jerusalem. It's going to become a big deal and everybody's going to talk about that table. Mm -hmm. But right now, Zacchaeus, I'm going to go break bread with you. And we don't know what happened at his house, but something great, what questions, what conversations, but this, this rude tax collecting guy that nobody likes, well, everybody in the crowd also gets angry at Jesus for going to go see the rich person in town that everybody hates. I don't think Perrysburg has one of those, do they? No, if they do, let, them, let me know who they are. I'll go visit them, all right? And so, but all of a sudden, Zacchaeus changes because simply Jesus decided to go break bread with him. And so then we see that Zacchaeus stood up. Because meeting Jesus always changes your life. And it always changes the people's lives around you. So Zacchaeus stood up in front of the crowd because everybody's wanting to know what's going around. It's, I love crowds. And he stood there and he said, look, half of my possession, Lord, I will give to the poor. The other half, I, if I have defrauded any, anyone or anything, I will pay back four times as much. And Jesus said to them, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. Now something happened there. It's what we call repentance. It's, it's that part of, 
I know in my heart I have done bad. And, and the Old Testament repentance, the Jewish repentance, would be simply to state, I know in my heart I have done bad. So this is where the bad is. I will turn myself from bad and look at good. God. And I will turn my heart towards good. That is true repentance in the Judaism way. All right? Here is bad. I recognize it. I say it to all this is bad. And I turn and say, now my heart is towards this. But Jesus always gives us more, doesn't he? And this, this doctor, Luke, shares that with us. He says that this particular man didn't say, hey, I am bad and my heart was bad. Now I will turn my heart towards good and God. He says, I will do one step more. I will move towards God and I will give for God. Because repentance requires more than just a simple change of the heart. It requires action from you. Well, restoration. Apologies. Money, things like that, whatever it is to make it right. I love the, the AA program because one of the, their steps is, is to recognize who they have hurt and then they have to go and say, I'm sorry. They don't have to receive your apology back. Their job is to say, I'm sorry I did this, Tim. Tim's allowed to still be angry at me. <laughs> but part of the restoration, part of the turning of the heart is that there is action steps. And our God asks the same from us. See, it requires action and restoration on the part of the one who needs forgiveness. You want to follow God? It's more than just saying, I love you, Jesus. I'm sorry for being bad. You have to step up and start doing stuff. I mean, doing the stuff doesn't get you saved. I'll be honest there. But it does show the world that Jesus is real. And that's what matters most for the kingdom of God to be at hand. So God takes the initiative in offering forgiveness, but there can only be there can be no salvation without repentance, and it always demands this. Change your heart and your mind about what's important in life, and then change your life accordingly. Huh? Man, two people both have a lot of things, right? Two different situations. Both of them met God. It's the same for us. Whatever you have, whatever you've got, wherever you're going, whatever has been, you have the same option. You have all come here today seeking to see who this Jesus is. I mean, you could be coming for a lot of years seeing who this Jesus is, or this could be your first time coming to see who Jesus is. And there's no one here going to force you, and that includes your parents, to decide for you what you're going to do as a response to that. It's up to you. But when you respond towards kingdom, for the we're towards Jesus, we're repentant heart, the kingdom of God is increased. And when it's increased, that means there's a little more joy, a little more happiness, a little more love, and a lot more fun. And you get the one thing that you're promised, eternal 